welcome back. We're uh, you're still working on your homework, and uh, the lecture this week will actually help you uh, with your homework. It overlaps like that. Mine is true, but I know you guys are making good progress because the emails I get are mainly pretty minor things so far. Of course, the, the true sufferers may not be emailing me. Mm -hmm. I really don't know, but um, that'll work itself out. Uh, let me get back into Imperial in my, my typical indirect fashion. So, this is the horoscope of Prince Iskander, who was the grandson of Tamerlane or Timur, who conquered most of what we now call the Near East. Uh, he was a descendant of Mongols and you know all that stuff. Um, uh, so, uh, I bring this up because often when I teach stats courses, I feel like it's, it's impossible, like doing horoscopes. Uh, in the sense, there's this impossible task where a bunch of people with particular criteria are asking me to give general vague advice to all of you at once, and yet you want it to be useful in your particular instances. So this is like newspaper horoscopes, right? Uh, they, they, they can only be appealing because they're so vague that they're useless. That's the only way they can be true, right? Uh, and that's why horoscopes are, sort of have that. Apologies to those who believe in astrology. It doesn't work. <laughs> Uh, but that's, that's sort of how the, the newspaper now internet horoscope. That's where internets are. Uh, that's where the horoscope is now on the internet. Um, that they, they can be appealing and remain credible because they're so vague. Uh, and often stats <laughs> courses degrade into that problem as well. And I always feel this tension when I teach these statistics. That it's, it's almost this impossible thing. I've got to teach you some general methods, and then there are all these details that are going to matter to each of you in particular in your little life. Uh, or your big life, sorry, uh, and the problems you have, because everybody has a big life, uh, way bigger than any of us can fill. And uh, uh, so I wanted to say this at the start, and, and that'll help you uh, calibrate uh, some of my commentaries that go along. I'm going to try to keep reminding you that I'm giving general advice, but you will know things about your particular study systems and your science and your questions that may legitimate violating any particular advice I give you. Uh, and you should trust yourself and not me. Uh, in that case, I'm, I mean, I'm happy to help you when you have your particular problems later and you come to me. Um, I do a lot, a lot of consulting in, in office hours about that sort of thing, and I, and I find it very rewarding. Uh, but usually it involves trying to dissuade you from doing something you've seen somebody else do. Uh, does that make some sense? So um, we're going to resist the horoscope, even though we have to start with the general, you know, casting of the bones and figuring out when you were born and where Mercury was and, and stuff like that. Uh, so this week, we're going to be doing linear regression, which is truly the Vega sort of model uh, that we could start with. Uh, but we'll learn a lot from it, and in your particular cases, you'll end up doing something better. Before we get into that, we just got a few slides that will help you um, interpret your homework, although I, I can tell from the emails I've received that you guys have pushed through this just fine. Um, we had just gotten to uh, uh, what's often called posterior predictive checking. Uh, these little machines uh, called statistical models can malfunction, and even when they function correctly, they may reveal themselves to be nonsensical by the answers they provide. So you, you have to do some sort of criticism at the end, and often this will mean plotting the implied predictions of the model. And we'll do a ton of that in this course. It's one of the main struggles that students find in this course is all the damn plotting. There's going to be a bunch of plotting, and every model needs to be plotted slightly differently because they're different. Uh, and, but you get good at it after a while, and it's something you really need to do to make sense of your statistical projects. Uh, so uh, the, the simplest sort of check, just check on function right now, and we'll do more sophisticated things later, um, is often called a posterior predictive check or simply a predictive check. It is posterior because we're going to use the uncertainty embodied in the posterior distribution to simulate implied data from the model. So the, the process of Bayesian updating or conditioning on the data sort of uh, pushes the data into the model and it constructs a posterior distribution. Now we push the posterior distribution back through the model, and it makes data. Uh, and it's, we're not lying because we're going to tell people we did that, right? It's not going to report it as the real data. So there's nothing naughty about it. Uh, uh, it's a way to check that you can understand what the model implies. Uh, and often, once you try this, you realize you don't like your model, or at least speaking for myself. And um, it, sometimes it reveals that the machine did something wrong. Um, and machines, can, machines aren't sophisticated like you. They don't know when they fall down on their face. Right? They just report answers. And uh, so we're going to start uh, by learning how to do this. Um, let me give you the conceptual uh, version of it. So here we have a humble posterior distribution for the globe tossing data. You, this is imprinted in your nightmares by now, right? This particular shape. Uh, and um, so along the bottom, we have the different uh, proportions or probabilities of water on the globe. Uh, and I'm going to isolate three different parameter values, three different probabilities of water labeled here A, B, and C. 
And each of them implies a different uh, uh, ensemble of predictions that are possible given simulated globe tossing. So, for example, if the true probability of water in the globe were at A there, which is a little bit below 0.5, let's call that 0.4, or I'll have it up here in a second, it's 0.38. Um, if that were the, the true value, and we had a globe where that was true, and we tossed it a bunch of times, uh, uh, nine times each, we'd get, uh, there's an uncertainty about what would happen, because you wouldn't always see the expectation, because the globe tosses are still, quote unquote, random. Uh, there's uncertainty about what will happen. Uh, so we get different counts of water observed simulating data if the true water coverage was 0.38. And the, the pie graph there is meant to show that uh, 0.38 is blue, is water, right? Most of the Earth is land under this wrong uh, globe. Uh, does this make sense so far? You with me? So you get uh, uh, over, I think I simulated over 10,000 uh, different simulated uh, sets of tossing the globe nine times the count of water. It has a minimum of zero, meaning we got land every time, it has a maximum of nine, we reserve water every time. Uh, both of those extreme cases are highly unlikely. Mainly you're going to get something that is close to 0.38, that is the, that's the expectation, but there's lots of scatter around it because if you only tossed it nine times. Make sense? Uh, that's, that's the implication of this particular parameter value, this particular conjecture. Uh, we can do that for B as well. At B, it's 0.64. Now there's more water than land. This is closer to reality. Um, reality, by the way, is like 0.71, just about or a little over 70% of the Earth. Just about 70% of the Earth is, is water. It's on the time of day. Always increasing, too. <laughs> uh, uh, so we simulate now, and you'll see that the uh, 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 simulated distribution of observations is shifted to the right because now the simulations assume there was more water on the you with me? Uh, these distributions of, of simulated data are often called sampling distributions. They are distributions that arise from particular assumptions about the conduct of sampling data. Right? This is all still in the small world. It's all still in the land of assumption. The real world has not intervened yet uh, uh, in this. And then the last case, let's think about C, a uh, really extreme case if it's 0.89. Now you see the sampling distribution is pushed up against the maximum. Right? It's no longer even vaguely symmetrical. Because in this case, most of the time you expect to get uh, seven, eight, or nine, really eight or nine waters, uh, because 90% of the globe is water. Does that make some sense? Now, of course, we don't know the true value, uh, but we do have a posterior distribution over the possible values uh, for the proportion of water coverage on the globe. And so if we want to get a sampling distribution that contains that uncertainty, we want to use the samples from the posterior distribution. And for each one, we can generate a sampling distribution. And then we can mix them all together. Uh, because we simulated for each sample from the posterior distribution, we made one of these sampling distributions like this. When we mix them all together, they'll, the, the simulated data will be present in the proper weightings, given the relative, uh, relative plausibilities contained in the posterior distribution. That doesn't make immediate sense. You're normal. It just means you're human. Uh, so there'll be a bunch of examples. And, and as typical, when you do your homework, you really get a chance to wrap your brain around this. Um, so uh, when we merge these together, uh, we get a more squashed distribution of implied data uh, because we're not sure what the actual value for P is. Uh, but we do have, given the data we've seen so far and the model that we're assuming, uh, we do have some information about which ones are more and less plausible. And the extreme values near 0 and 1 are highly implausible given the data we've seen. In fact, 0 and 1 are strictly impossible. Uh, given the data we've seen, because we've seen at least one water and one land. Uh, lots of ones in between uh, uh, are more plausible, and the most plausible ones um, give us 6 out of 9, because that's the data we saw. I put the um, thick black bar there on the far right graph, indicates the actual observed data, and it is central uh, to this uh, uh, distribution of simulated data that we see here. Um, so one way you can think about this is the model reproduces the actual observation with very high likelihood. It's right in the middle, but it's also highly uncertain about what the thing is going to right? Because we haven't had a lot of data yet. There's still a lot of uncertainty in the posterior prediction. So this is a calibration. This is a way to visualize what the model expects. If you made your little golem predict the future, this is its conjecture that embodies all the uncertainty that's still in the posterior. And if you used instead, I'll, I'll get to your question in a second, thank you. Uh, if you used instead only one of the values, it would be anti-conservative. It would throw away all that work 
that you went through to get the posterior distribution in the first place. And you would end up being overconfident in some dastardly way that would make the world explode. Right? Question? Um, where did you come up with the probabilities of the amounts of water that you used for the three different, um, to like merge these two? Um, uh, creative inspiration. I just, I've got the curve and I just picked A, B, and C. The actual merger on the right uses the infinite number of them. It uses all of them. It, it, uh, and I'll, I'm going to show you how to do this in the code on the next slide. So this is a good question. Uh, I should repeat for my computer what the question was. Um, the question was, where did I, how did I choose A, B, and C? I, I chose them just for the sake of example because they were basically evenly spaced and, you know, on different sides of the posterior mode. Um, but the merge distribution on the far right actually uses every value of P weighted by its posterior probability. In other words, we, we say we integrate over the uncertainty in the posterior distribution, which is just a fancy word for averaging, weighted averaging. When we say integrate over in probability theory, we nearly always just mean uh, a weighted average. Um, so uh, one, you guys have already got samples. I showed you on Thursday, and, and you've already done some exercise on this on your own. I showed you on Thursday how to draw samples from a posterior distribution. This makes this integration task a lot easier than it might be otherwise. Because um, now just for each sample, you run one of these simulations. Uh, and uh, so if we had 10,000 samples from the posterior distribution, we can feed it into our binome. Our binome is the random binomial function. It simulates binomial draws. Each of these simulations will have a size equals nine tosses of the globe. And what is spit out or emitted by our binome and stored in the symbol NW in the line of our code here are the counts of observed water. They're integers from zero to nine. Okay, uh, so we have each, we have one simulation for every draw from the posterior distribution. We have 10,000 of them. And so these simulations at the end uh, integrate over the uncertainty in the posterior distribution, right? So we get a conservative prediction of forecast. Does this make some sense? Yeah, question. So this line of code basically skips over the middle column in the last slide. Yeah, it does the middle column invisibly for you. It, infinitely and then makes the last and yeah make that and makes the merge thing at the end exactly right question was so this code skips over the middle column in the previous figure yes is the answer yeah so at least the way the homework's laid out and this problem as well in some sense you're drawing 10,000 times we happen I think to have 10,000 samples um, but in reality if you do a thousand times with prop equals samples how is this selecting from your samples value? Okay, so the question was, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll translate. You tell me if I got it right. Uh, this, my translation of the question for posterity in my computer is, uh, so in this particular case, we, samples contains 10,000 values because that's what we decided to draw on you know, previous slides. And 1E4 is 10,000. We're going to do 10,000 simulations. They match. So we get one simulation for each sample. What if they don't match? Then what happens? Then what R does is it recycles the vector. So whichever one is shorter gets recycled in order. So if you only had 1,000 samples and you did 10,000 simulations, it would, use, it, would use each, it would use it 10 times. It would use that vector of 1,000 10 times, starting over at the beginning again. You don't want to do that. You want to make a match. Okay? Otherwise, you're going to get some weird correlated simulations or something. Right? You'll end up getting bad rates. Uh, your, your computers have a ton of memory, at least for these simple models. So you go crazy. You could do... You could do a million, uh, no exaggeration, be no problem. Near the end of the course, we'll have models with a few thousand parameters in them, uh, just for kicks. Uh, and in that case, uh, uh, you may not want to do this. Uh, the good news is, um, as you'll see uh, today, uh, posterior distributions are often quite normally distributed, normal shaped. And in that case, you don't need a lot of samples to describe them, uh, because you can get a really good estimate of the mean of standard deviation with a small number of samples, even a thousand. <laughs> Uh, so, and we're not launching space shuttles, as I keep joking, right? Um, uh, so we're not going to fetishize precision where there really is none, uh, actually. But it's a good question. There was another question back there? No? No? Okay. Tom had a question. No, you're done. Okay. Um, don't be shy about asking questions. The point of being in class is so you can interrupt me, right? Otherwise, I would lecture to my computer at home and upload it and sleep all day. That's, right. that's, that's how it would go. Uh, okay, so later on, actually today, this will get a little bit harder, but the strategy will remain the same, and the rethinking package contains a number of convenience functions I'll introduce you to, maybe today, if not today on Thursday, that automate a lot of this. But I want you to, the first time I introduce you, I'm going to help you understand what it's doing. 
question. So when we are looking at our sort of data within the model or within the metadata, data, is there any way that we should be quantitatively describing that or is it just visualizing it and seeing it in the middle of the description? Good question. So the question was, uh, little computer, um, <laughs> uh, when we're doing this, uh, we're, we're visualizing the uncertainty in these graphs, but quantitatively, how should we describe it? Uh, I'm being shy about that right now because I don't think there's a general answer to that. And this actually predicts my next slide. Uh, I think it depends upon what you want to do, your scientific purpose. Um, there's, a, there's a kind of a tradition of doing chi-square tests uh, to figure out if the observed data are comfortably within the simulated envelope there. Uh, in this case, you can tell just by eyeballing that you don't need to do a chi-square test here. That would be fetishizing, right? Um, and I, I don't really have anything against that, a chi-square goodness of fit test in this context, as long as you treat it informally. And the problem is, of course, you'll need some threshold to decide to accept or reject, and the threshold will ultimately be arbitrary, unless you do a real cost-benefit analysis. Uh, so that's why I'm being a little bit vague. And then this comes back to the horoscope of Prince Iskander, right? Uh, in general, I can't give you good advice about that, and I'm going to try to resist trying to cast a horoscope for you. Uh, in the context of particular data analysis examples through the course, I'll be able to say something better. And when you're referring to that arbitrary threshold, you're thinking of that traditional value? Yeah, like a 5% or something. But I think the general procedure makes some sense because you're trying to get a measure of how far out in the tail the observed data are. Right. Uh, that, that can be quite useful as a calibration and as a form of communication. But just quote how far the quantile it is far out is, it would be one way to summarize where it is, I think. The threshold then is a different, it's like masquerading as decision theory, I think, and I'll have something more to say about that later. Um, okay. All right, I see people scratching their chins, which is fine, but I'm going to keep looking at it because I think you're maybe about to ask a question, right? It's a teacher instinct that de develops over time. Um, okay, so this brings me to this, uh, where I was going to say something about this, is um, this, this process of generating uh, the posterior predictive distribution and then asking where the observed data in is a good way to figure out if the model did its job right. Uh, the observed data should be in there comfortably, and you want to get some calibration on that. But then there's often this quest to figure out, but then quantitatively, what decisions should I make based on that? And I think it's hard to give general advice. Uh, we're in horoscope land. Um, in fact, I think there's universally no best way because uh, scientific purposes are very diverse. Um, and no single criterion can, is always justifiable, like the 5%, right? And, and I want to say, I say this in the notes too, Fisher, uh, Ronald Fisher is often blamed for this 5% thing because it was in one of his 1920s books, but he had the most casual justification of it in there. It was like, yeah, it seems convenient right now we use 5% because that's a z-score of about 2, and it seems harmless, you know, and at the time it was. Uh, but then, you know, uh, insecure scientists took that 5% and used it as a ritual to clean their hands of guilt. <laughs> Lots of stuff. And, but I don't think it's Fisher's fault. Uh, that the 5% caught on so strongly. Uh, it's clear, I think, that it's just a convention, right? The only thing objective about 5% is that everybody uses it, right? It uh, doesn't mean it's, it's good. Um, uh, in general, I think you need our imagination, and, and often what posterior predictive checks are for is some way to, all models do something silly. Uh, this one's so simple that, that it's hard to use it as a good example, but we'll have good examples later. All models make bad predictions for some subset of the observations. And so these posterior predictive checks can be a ways to spur our imagination to think about a better process model uh, for the data. And then through multiple cycles of modeling and empirical investigation, you can make models that are better and better. Uh, so this has this kind of, this kind of iterative effect where it helps us find flaws with the model, and then we can try to theorize ways um, uh, to improve those things. Now, we do have to be careful, and I'll, I'll emphasize this as we go through the course. We have to be careful not to chase noise because no model will ever make perfect predictions. In fact, there are lots of really interesting phenomena in nature which cannot, when we get the right model, what the model tells us is we can't predict these things. So like the weather two weeks out, you know, good luck, right? Uh, unless there's a hurricane two weeks out. But uh, uh, there are lots of phenomena in nature which are highly indeterminate. Uh, birth, human births, uh, predict the sex of, of someone's next child, right? We have the right model, and the right model tells us you can't do it. <laughs> with very high probability, right? So. That's the world, folks, and, and it's a wonderful one, worthy of writing poetry about. Um, anyway, and, and I have this quote from Jaynes, which I think he, he says it quite well. Jaynes was um, a physicist, an American physicist. He was also a, an officer in the Navy. Uh, this is him looking handsome as a young man. Uh, and uh, he did a lot uh, in Bayesian inference, and my, my sort of philosophy of Bayesian inference follows heavily on, on Jaynes. Uh, those of you who've read some Jaynes, you'll recognize that. Um, 
I will say though, James was a very pugnacious person, so you have to be careful when you watch when you read him. He's very doctrinaire, uh, and I try to be considerably less uh, doctrinaire than than he was. Okay, let me give you the pit stop here, and we'll get into new material. Um, the program so far, we're, we're making models because we're we take as one purpose in science is to make uh, uh, predictive models of natural phenomena. These models help us forecast and see what's going to happen, as well as understand things uh, that have already happened. Um, we make the model go by conditioning on data, uh, and we do that. We, we derive some approximation of the posterior distribution. That distribution gives us the relative plausibilities, conditional on this model and these data, uh, of the different conjectures, that, the different adjustable bits of the model that could have generated the data. We usually call those little bits parameters. Um, then we use this posterior distribution to describe our uncertainty. It could be very peaked. Uh, we'll get some peaked distributions today. It'll make you feel good. Um, and uh, uh, sometimes it'll be very wide, but either way, there's this kind of safety device built into using it uh, because the width of the posterior distribution gives you an idea of your uncertainty. Um, and we can then add more data later and improve upon that. Um, and then we need to check the model. And I've only showed you one way so far. Uh, we'll get more examples as we go. So a uh, little bit remind you of the philosophy. Uh, the inference here is in the language of probability, and this is deeply frustrating. Your model will only talk to you in probabilities. It gives you distributions, and it doesn't speak human. So a lot of what we do in this course will be generating implied predictions from these posterior distributions. We'll spend a lot of time on that. We'll start it today. Uh, the best parameter value is not really the focus. The whole distribution is the quote-unquote estimate. Right? It's deduced, so it's not an estimate of something. It's a logical consequence of your assumptions and the data. Um, uh, and, of course, even uh, the best uh, value may be terrible. Uh, uh, models take themselves for granted, uh, but you should never take your model for granted. And I'll, I'll, we'll have an example of that, probably not today, but on Thursday, where the model gets really, really confident because there's a lot of data, but it's a terrible model. And the model can't see that, but you will be able to. Uh, and I'll show you an example on Thursday, if I can stay on time. Okay, let's get into linear regression. Uh, so... Let me introduce this by, by asserting that uh, uh, linear regression is the geocentric model of statistics. Uh, now let me try to unpack that. And I don't mean that as an insult, because geocentrism is awesome. It's just wrong. That's its only problem. <laughs> so Claudius Ptolemy, uh, really an incredible intellect, uh, a member of this lineage. I think they were the Greeks that sort of were given, that Alexander gave Egypt to. I think this is the history. Someone here may know this better than me. But the Ptolemies built the library of Alexandria, and you know, basically meaning they stole scrolls from boats and hoarded them in a library. Right? And then some barbarians burned them all later, or at least most of them. But you know, that's that's history. Uh, Ptolemy is uh, invented this model, um, or rather improved upon a model that he had received through modification and descent. But he did a lot of work, a model for uh, predicting the positions of the planets in the heavens. Uh, and some stars as well. And we now know this model is the geocentric model, quite casually, or the Ptolemaic model of the solar system. And the physical analogy in this model is that the Earth is at the middle and everything goes around it. That's sort of how we perceive it when we stand uh, and look at the sky. And um, the thing about this model, I can start it into motion here if my computer will behave. Yeah, there it goes. Uh, the thing about this model is if you know the physical structure of the solar system, it's absolutely goofy. And it's extra goofy because it it achieves its predictions by using this device called epicycles, which are orbits on orbits. You can vaguely see them. Uh, this will be way better when you watch it at home. Uh, uh, the colored circles that are orbiting one another and their little planets on the outer circles, and they keep spinning around. And this is not how the solar system actually works, right? But uh, it turns out that this is a really accurate model. If all you want to do is spot Mars in the sky, this works incredibly well. Uh, it, over time, it gets wrong, and you have to refit it. Uh, that's true, like every 150 years or so. Uh, it slowly gets out of, out of whack. But once it's reset, then it's really accurate. It's perfectly good for amateur astronomy. You want to find Venus or Mars, it works great. If you want to get a probe to Mars, you're going to miss, <laughs> right? Because it's got the wrong model of where things are. But for just spotting something, finding it in the sky, it works great. And in particular, it's able to predict, and this is what it was constructed to do, it's able to predict the retrograde motion of planets in the sky. So Mars will be trucking along in the sky and then kind of goes backwards. That's why they're called wanderers. The planet is Latin for wanderer. And uh, uh, that is now explained by the fact that we're moving too. Uh, but at the time, they had to invent some mathematical device to get this thing to go backwards, and that's when it loops back, so Mars on my screen is about to do it again. Uh, so that creates this retrograde motion. It's, this is a fantastic mathematical achievement, this model. 
It works incredibly well. You can still use it today as long as you recalibrate it um, to the current positions of the planets. Uh, and not only that, but it's an example of a Fourier series, which uh, those of you who had some uh, uh, engineering exposure in particular, or a particular kind of math background, a Fourier series is a general way to take any kind of cyclical, func uh, cyclical function and represent it with an infinite series that you can truncate. So uh, the epicycles here are giving you this periodic functioning. Uh, so you, not only is, is this accurate, but whatever the structure of the solar system, as long as the planets are on orbits, which are cyclical functions, you can always describe it with a geocentric model. Exactly. You can get arbitrary precision by adding more and more little circles on circles. Now, that way lies badness, no doubt. Uh, and we'll return to that next week. Uh, but this thing works really well. It's a fascinating uh, thing. Uh, so let me, let me make my analogy now that I started this with. Uh, linear regression is the geocentric model of statistics. Um, it's an approximation that can be constructed to an arbitrary degree of precision. Uh, but it only describes what is going on. It never actually explains it in any kind of satisfying way. Uh, and that makes it incredibly useful as long as you're cautious about what you do with it. And that's the way I want to teach linear regression. Linear regression, there's nothing to be ashamed of using it. It's quite good. But it doesn't get at nature's nuts and bolts. It doesn't see the machinery. Uh, it, it's a way of constructing general approximations or associations among variables. That's what it's good for. And it's really good at that. Uh, but it isn't, you can't take it too seriously, right? Uh, uh, okay, so uh, with linear regression, I want to start with um, uh, Gauss, pictured here on the old uh, German uh, 10 mark note. Uh, it's a great thing about European money is they put intellectuals and scientists and stuff, right? So the Bridge Pound has Darwin on one of them, and in Germany you have Gauss, who's probably the greatest mathematician who ever lived, uh, many, many mathematicians think. Uh, and uh, right on there, you have the Gaussian distribution function. So this used to be, uh, I was a school kid in Germany, and people used to cheat, right? Because if you had a 10 mark note, <laughs> right there. <laughs> um, uh, the linear regression is a, a family of simple statistical machines or golems that model the mean and variance of some measure using additive combinations of other things you've measured. Uh, we'll nail this down in particular examples as we go. Um, and it assumes that across all values uh, of these other things you've measured, the variance is constant. And you'll see that when we, when we learn to write the model in a particular way. Uh, now, I want to uh, say that Gauss is responsible for this because he had this, uh, in this particular manuscript, he had an eight, in, in eight, came out in 1809, uh, he had a Bayesian argument for the normal, that is Gaussian, what we now call Gaussian, he didn't call it that, <laughs> right? Uh, normal error in least squares estimation. He invented least squares estimation to solve an astronomical problem. He was trying to forecast when a comet was going to come back around. In fact, he got famous in his 20s for this. You know, to predict this. He developed linear regression because he needed to solve this problem, predict the comet. He's a smart guy. Uh, and, but it's a fully Bayesian argument. It really is. And then, you know, this was 1809, and, you know, Fisher is the early 1900s. Uh, so uh, uh, this is just to caution you. There are lots of different ways to justify the same statistical procedure. And the original justification of least squares estimation was Bayesian, and that's how we're going to think about it. But that, that is not the way you probably first learned it, right? Well, you probably first learned it as do this or you fail, right? <laughs> but <laughs> we're going to try to do better uh, than that. So let me give you some motivation before we get into code. There'll be some software carpentry today. We'll start to do a lot of that in this course. But um, let me give you some motivation about why the normal distribution um, is so useful and so common. Uh, and, and this will also help you understand later in the course why there are often really good reasons not to use it as a foundation for your modeling. So this is the oldie Gaussian distribution. Um, it's extremely common in statistics. And I think there are three major uh, justifications people use, uh, and different people like different ones. The first is that it's just really convenient. It's easy to do math with a normal distribution. It is, uh, uh, compared to other <coughs> things, right? Uh, uh, the second is it's fairly common in nature, which isn't to say that a Gaussian distribution ever exactly exists in nature, but nature produces collections of measurements which aggregate towards approximately Gaussian all the time and quite rapidly. And I want to give you some intuition about why that's true in the next series of slides. Uh, and then third, a little bit more cryptically, but we'll unpack this over multiple weeks, is that it's the most logical assumption given a certain state of information that you start with, which is to say, if all you're willing to say about a collection of measurements is their mean and their variance, uh, then it is illogical to describe those measurements as anything except the Gaussian distribution. And I'll unpack that as we go along. 
Now, of course, if so, for example, if, if the measurements are skewed, then you wanna you need another parameter to describe the skew, right? So if you're not willing to actually measure the skew, then use a Gaussian distribution. And we'll unpack this when we get to chapter six. We'll spend a bunch of time on that. Um, okay, so uh, think about a soccer field, um, and we can go out to the soccer field here on campus, and I can have a bunch of you line up on in the middle of the field, line in the middle of the field, whatever that's called. Someone here who likes soccer, tell me what that line is called. Mid midfield line? Yeah, all right, thank you. Yeah, I grew up in Germany, but, you know, it's, that's all people play there is, is soccer. Uh, now I'm resisting invading Poland jokes, but <laughs> I just guess I just made one. <laughs> but, uh, so, all right. Uh, now, imagine each of you has got a coin, and um, on, on the count of three, each person's going to toss their coin personally, and if it comes up tails, they're going to take a step to the left, and if it comes up right... Uh, Heads are going to take a step to the right, rather. So we can do that simulation. Say everybody jitters a little bit. And we can do this for multiple rounds. Um, next toss, uh, some people move further out. Some people move back towards the center line. Um, yet again, some further distribution, some back to the center line. And all these little binary movements. Uh, now, at the end, we can do this, say, 100 times with a, a bunch of people on, on uh, the midfield line. And then we collect the distances from the line in the middle, uh, both positive and negative. You know, how far to the left you are and how far to the right you are. <laughs> and we can think about that distribution of distances and what it aggregates to. So let me show you uh, a simulation of this as we um, go along the step number. That is the number of coin flips that have been done and the number of accumulated steps that have happened. Uh, initially, everybody's at the same point, position zero there, shown in this graph. And after four coin flips... We've got a cloud shown here by all the little gray trails. Each trail is a person that's wandering around. And I'm simulating for, I don't know, like a thousand here. It's a really big soccer field, something like that, or a bunch of really small people. I don't know. And the, the solid one is just to help you trace a particular person. That's you, say. You're the, you're the protagonist in this story. Uh, and everybody else has got the wrong path, and <laughs> you're going through it. But there's a scatter. And you notice that the envelope is increasing. We can take all the values there at that vertical slice of four and plot them out as a distribution. And it's noisy. Uh, doesn't look, look like a normal distribution quite yet. The tails aren't thick enough. Um, but it is, it is symmetrical, roughly. We keep the experiment going. Uh, we're going to get out to eight now. And you see that it's still increasing. Uh, now it's looking more Gaussian, right? The tails are starting to have that little flare that the bell curve has. Um, and by the time we get out to 16, uh, at the end of this uh, particular experiment on this slide, uh, it's statistically indistinguishable from a Gaussian, unless you have a really uptight statistical fit test of some kind. Um, how does this happen? You get the Gaussian distribution from uh, natural mechanisms like this all the time. Uh, this is how it works. Uh, if you add up a bunch of things, in this case, the steps of each individual, uh, that collective of sums aggregates towards a Gaussian distribution. Uh, it may, that aggregation may take a long time, depending upon the distribution of things you're adding. In this case, it's just little steps left and right. Uh, the distribution of, of that could be really weird and skewed. You'll still end up with a Gaussian distribution eventually. Um, and uh, the reason, the casual reason, um, this is hard to understand, but the casual reason is because these little steps are like fluctuations. And when you add fluctuations together, they dampen one another. So imagine you get... Uh, 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 a bunch of steps to the right, uh, eventually you'll get enough coin flips to go to the left to cancel all those steps to the right. So that after enough steps that you add together, the most likely thing is that you're back on the center line. Uh, and it's really a perverse and weird thing about the universe. And I also think benign, because a whole lot of science would be impossible without the central limit theorem, which is what we're talking about here. Uh, so when you add things together, the fluctuations dampen one another. Uh, and so the aggregation of those sums tends to approach a symmetrical curve. Uh, it's a physical generative phenomenon that is, makes a lot of stuff possible in the world. At the same time, the um, consequence of this is that the underlying distribution is erased. So many things end up Gaussian that you can't look at a Gaussian distribution and see what generated it, uh, unless you have a lot of other kind of data. Right? So I use an example in the book of talking about height. Uh, human height is approximately normally distributed, only approximately. There's an excess of really short, really tall people in the human population because of epistasis. The biologists here know something about this. And uh, nevertheless, it's, it's pretty much approximately Gaussian. Um, that doesn't tell you anything, though, about the architecture of human development. 
right? The fact that height is approximately Gaussian, you can imagine a really a, an effectively infinite number of ways to generate a person uh, from that fact. Uh, so it doesn't it doesn't work backwards, right? Lots of processes generate Gaussian, but given a Gaussian, you can't then infer what generated it. All you know is stuff got added together. Uh, the, the notes have some uh, simulations for you to explore to prove this to yourself. That I hope you will enjoy with a glass of wine or something, to make it more entertaining. Um, here's a, a great example: Francis Galton in 1894 built a mechanical. It was called a bean machine because beans are falling down. Uh, from the top here, and they're bouncing off these um, uh, little obstacles in the way. This is like on the Price is Right. There was a particular game. Anybody remembers the Price is Right with Bob Barker? It's like the Chico machine or something like that. And that was a Gaussian distribution generator as well. Uh, all these little binary moves are like the steps on the soccer field, and you get this, this approximately Gaussian distribution of beans in the bins at the bottom as well. Um, so Galton was interested in using this to, to explore the normal distribution. And Galton did a lot. Uh, to establish linear regression uh, as a workhorse in, in demography and other fields. So uh, think about processes that produce normal distributions are things that add things together. And natural processes add things together uh, quite a lot, actually. So this is like genetics does this. You have approximately add independent additive effects of a bunch of loci. That's summation, uh, aggregation on a larger scale. Turns out that products of small deviations are also approximately addition. Uh, so uh, that will give you normal distributions as well. And uh, logarithms of products... Uh, uh, when you take a logarithm of a product, it's a sum uh, for mathematical reasons that some of you will remember from grade school, right? Uh, so lots, this is why normal distributions are unreasonably common and uh, often unreasonably good to use. We're not going to work much with the mathematical uh, uh, form of these density functions in this class. You can always look them up if you need them, right? There's this thing called the Internet, and if you put in Gaussian distribution function, you'll get this right away. Uh, you don't need to memorize it, although you will effectively if you use it a few times. All I want to say about it is, like all probability density functions, it has a structure that is meaningful that you want to learn. And it will help you memorize it as well. So in this case, I've translated this into vaguely English form, although the grammar here is questionable. right? Uh, so we're going to use this mainly as a likelihood function, so the probability of some data x conditional on parameters. Uh, the first part of this with the pi in it is the standardizer. That's just the thing that makes the area under the curve equal 1. You solve for it. But it doesn't determine the shape. It just determines the height of the thing. It's a multiplier that determines the height of, of the curve. All the actions inside the exponent here. Uh, and the mu minus x part is where it is. Mu is a location parameter. It's the mean. Um, the exponent is a shape, uh, which is a 2. It's a constant. But you can make that a 3, and you get a different shape. The bell curve comes from squaring the distance from the mean. Right, the deviation from the mean. And that's what creates the bell curve. If you exponentiate, so you may recognize this as a parabola, right? You've got that difference uh, squared. That's a parabolic function or polynomial theory. If you don't remember that, that's cool. You're awesome. Don't worry about it. You have better things in your brain. Uh, but if you exponentiate a parabola, you get a bell curve. And that's where bell curves come from. They're exponentiated parabolas. So one way you can think about this is a log Gaussian distribution is a parabola. Why log? Because log undoes the exponentiation. And that's all. So I, why do I tell you this? I tell you this to demystify this thing. Um, nevertheless, it arises from first principles. If you do that fluctuation exercise and you do the mass stats, you can derive this. Uh, and there are lots of proofs of the central limit theorem uh, from many different origin points. Okay. Uh, the main thing is to think uh, you can standardize this in terms of the sigma, the standard deviation, which is how wide the distribution is. And about 95% of the Probability mass in a normal distribution is between two standard deviations, uh, below and above the mean. So this is, uh, by no accident, approximately the same as, say, leaving 5% out in the tails, 2.5% on each side. Right? So this is the uh, one origin story of the 5% convention. But there's nothing special about it. Uh, but this is a way to calibrate. Right? About two-thirds of the probability is within one standard deviation up and down, and 95% of it within two. It's just a way to help you think about the distribution. So let me reiterate um, uh, these two more confusing justifications of the Gaussian distribution. Remember, the first one was it's easy to do math with it. That's not a great justification, though, right? So if you're trying to justify why you did what you did to the president, you say, well, it was easy to do math that way, Mr. President. And then you're, you know, uh, you're in a black ops site pretty fast, right? So uh, there are two other better justifications. First is the ontological one. Under many situations, there are lots of generative processes in nature which produce approximately Gaussian distributions because they add lots of little influences together. Those little influences cancel one another, 
And so the aggregation of those sums ends up being approximately bell curve. So even if you don't know the generative process, this isn't a bad bet to start with. The other, uh, that's ontological because it's how things come into being. Remember that's ontology? Uh, the other justification is epistemology. The epistemological justification is, okay, all I'm willing to say about this collection of measurements is their mean invariance. Uh, you know, the distribution where all you say about it is its mean invariance is the Gaussian. Um, in fact, it's uniquely the best on a criterion that we'll talk about a lot in Chapter 6. Uh, and that criterion is called maximum entropy. Uh, the Gaussian distribution is a distribution for any given mean invariance, which has the largest information entropy. One way to think about that is this is a distribution that can be realized the greatest number of ways. What ways? The ways through the Garden of Forking data. Um, I'll, I'll be very rigorous about that. Uh, well, marginally rigorous about that in Chapter 6 when we get there, um, when we talk about maximum entropy again. Uh, but just to foreground, it, maximum entropy is just the thing you've already done with the marbles. It really is, but I'm going to cast it in a different light um, when we get there. Uh, these two sorts of justifications can live well together as well. Uh, you don't have to choose one. Okay. Um, the fact is, uh, regardless of how you justify it, people use models like this a lot, so we need to understand them, and they are useful. They're geocentric. Right? We shouldn't be embarrassed to use a geocentric model. You could find Mars with it. But you just can't believe its mechanistic statements. So there are lots of examples. The general linear model and statistics, they're all, in a sense, just Gaussian models of some outcome with different kinds of functions inside of them, which adjust the mean uh, and the variance um, uh, as, a, as an effect of predictors. So t-tests, uh, uh, single regression, multiple regression, ANOVA, all the OVAs, right? ANOVA, ANCOVA, MANOVA, uh, MANCOVA, Biostats people are, are uh, in pain from these things. Used to be in previous generations, you had to take a course uh, on this campus and all the OVAs, mm -hmm. right? And people came out of it with uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome, uh, endless tables of sums, right? Some of you have done this. And we're not going to do any of that because it's useless. But uh, uh, we're going to learn it in a different way. So you can write the model down so you can see the relationships among them. Uh, and, and interpret them and generate predictions from them as well. I should say it's useless. It's just like the, the least useful way to process the model. But it's the way it was traditionally done because of this book called Biometry, which scarred generations of biologists. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, you don't need a copy of that book. Uh, okay, so we want a language for modeling. Um, there are lots of alternative ways to construct this, but I want to give you what I think is a useful, uh, robust way to approach general problems. Uh, we have some questions to answer in data analysis. So what are the outcomes that I'm interested in modeling as a function of other things? That's often what it is where most scientists are interested in causal statements, meaning that there's something that causes something else. And these questions embody those things. Uh, but it could also just be descriptive, like in the, in the geocentric model. Uh, we've got some measurements we want to use that to predict other things. Um, so there are some measurements that we call outcomes. Those are the things that the model will have on the left-hand side, as you'll see in a minute, the, the things that it will predict, make predictions for. Um, uh, we make some assumptions about how these outcomes are generated. This is your data story. Uh, this gives us a likelihood function. Uh, then we make dec some decision about which variables, if any, are the predictor variables. And these variables we will stick into the likelihood function through clever devices. Um, uh, and then we, we make choices inside there about how to relate them. Uh, and then for each parameter, uh, that and typically you'll see how the parameters enter into these general models. For each parameter, we have to choose a prior, which is the initial information state of the machine before it's seen the data, remember. That's all it is. It's not your information state. It's the machine's information state, right? You don't have a prior distribution in your head, probably. You're a normal human being. Uh, uh, so we'll get, let's, let's bring this down to some precise example then by revisiting the globe tossing model from last week. Um, you've seen this kind of model-based notation before. We're going to use this throughout the course because if I teach you this modeling language, you can read a whole bunch of things. This is the convention in the field of statistics, and it can be used to notate a very large number of models. Um, it doesn't have everything in it because there are computational details uh, that are sublimated out, but that's what makes this notation useful. Uh, it's like a map to the model structure and its assumptions. So that's how we'll read it. So let me give you a little bit of a crib sheet to it. The outcome uh, in this model was NW, which is the observed numbers of waters that you saw. And that happened to be 6 at the time. So that's the value 6. And the tilde, mean you want to read that as is distributed. Uh, then binomial is the name of the likelihood function we used in this model. And it's a function of two values, uh, which are often called parameters, n and p. 
Uh, in was also data in that case because we knew how many times we had tossed the globe, which was good because otherwise the inference problem would have been hard. Right? Uh, and P was unknown, so we want to estimate P. We're asking a question about it, so we assign the machine some initial state of relative plausibilities of every possible value of P, and we call that a prior. In this case, we made it uniform. So P is distributed uh, uniformly uh, in this case, and uniform is the prior distribution. So if you want to read this in plain English, you could read this as the count in W is distributed binomially with sample size n and probability P. The prior for P is assumed to be uniform between 0 and 1. And this, is, this programs your machine. Right? Does this make some sense? Uh, so this notational convention, you've certainly seen models like this before. It has a lot of advantages. Uh, we're going to do it with linear regression. So to get to the linear regression example, first let's get some data to work with. So you can think about it in the context of the data example instead of total abstraction land. Um, and we'll get more abstract as we draw the lens out later, uh, probably on Thursday. So uh, these data are in the rethinking package, um, Howell 1. Uh, these are data that come from this book, uh, Life Histories of the Dobe Kung uh, by Nancy Howell. And there's a lot of um, reproductive life history interviews that were done with uh, Kung women. Uh, so all their kids and their kids' weights and all this stuff. And there's lots of biometric data as well. Um, and it's about growth and nutrition and, and uh, human life history theory. So we're going to be looking at just a slice of this data, um, the anonymized heights, weights. Uh, uh, we'll use age as well in some of these analyses. So I use this. This is not the most exciting data in the world, and it's not a very penetrating scientific question to ask here, uh, although you'll start to see some questions about you know, transitions in growth rate uh, in the data as we go through. Uh, but it's the simple sort of thing where we can look at it and height is approximately normal, but it'll also show you one thing, which is obviously when we get close to a height of zero, it's not normally distributed anymore, right? Uh, so nothing is actually normally distributed in a mathematical sense because normal distributions uh, are legitimate between negative infinity and positive infinity. You've never measured anything with a ruler that big, right? So uh, you have to uh, obey your boundaries at some point. This will this will emerge naturally as you go through. Um, so on, on the on this slide on the right. Um, I've just plotted out the distribution uh, empirically of um, adult heights in the sample. So I've taken kids uh, out of the data. In, in the notes, I show you how to do that. Um, and then the first thing we do is we define the likelihood. We're going to model uh, the height of each individual eye. That's what the little I is under the H here now. Refer to an individual. It's an individual observation. Uh, as normal with some mean mu and some standard deviation sigma. So define the distribution. Yeah, question. Uh, just real quick. Do you refer to notes? That's synonymous to the book. Yes, right? yes. So the question was, I refer to notes, and is that synonymous to the book? Yes, they're the same thing. Sorry. They're, they're, when it's published, I call it a book. Right now it's notes. <laughs> I mean, whatever. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Um, I've been teaching this class for so many years now. They started off with these really embryonic and terrible notes. <laughs> right? And then through the uh, peer pressure of people like you in the class, they have gotten better. And so it's all thanks to students, right? Just telling me, like, could you make some sense, Richard? And then over the years, I have endeavored to make some sense. And so they've, they're still notes to me, but they're a book to you. Uh, they'll always be notes. Like, my, my son will always be my son. <laughs> um, anyway, so uh, again, to, to help you in your practice of reading these things, we could read this as the height h sub i of an individual i is distributed normally with mean mu and standard deviation sigma. So it finds a distributional assumption. Remember, this is geocentric. We're not saying anything about how the individual differences in height arise. We're assigning a common distribution to them all. all right? We're just going to start with that. So we're going to be estimating the mean and the standard deviation of adult heights in this community. Right? Uh, it's effectively what we'll get. So h sub i is the outcome again. Uh, tilde means is distributed. The normal distribution is the likelihood. Mu is the mean of the normal distribution. Sigma is the standard deviation. You can use whatever labels you want there. They don't have to be the little Greek letters mu and sigma, but that's just conventional, and I need to teach you guys conventions, right? You'll still encounter it in the world. Is that a question? No? Okay. Sorry, it's a teacher tick. It's like when you, when you auto-groom, I'm going to think you're asking a question. Um, so now we need priors so the machine can get going. Uh, all Bayesian statistical models need some initial information state. This is what we call the prior. 
So uh, in this case, we're going we're to stick with our vague priors, uh, but I want to show you how you can visualize the priors. And this is, when, you're, when you're starting out, you're trying to understand priors. Remember, they're just distributions, so you can plot them just like anything else. They're just distributions. In fact, you can sample from them. You like sampling, right? And then you can answer questions about it. Uh, so in this case, I'm going to assign uh, the mean is going to be centered on what I know is the population mean, actually, with some vague, uh, big standard deviation, actually. Remember, this is for the mean. It's not for the population. This is the prior for the location of the mean. So standard deviation 10 means, I don't know, it's somewhere around typical adult height, right? Uh, and uh, then a uniform for the standard deviation between 0 and 50. If we visualize these two, they look like this. So if you think about uh, calibrating it, the mean could be anywhere between 140 centimeters and, and 170, which is a big range. That's, a, that's like worldwide height variation, right? And uh, then this uh, puts no probability above 50. Um, if that causes a malfunction, you know how to detect that, and we'll see. But it assigns equal weight to every value um, below 50. And 50 is plenty. It's not going to be that big. Um, we can, now remember these, uh, these, you have a prior on two parameters now, so this should be a little bit confusing if you're paying attention, if you are, yeah. Yeah, I see some confused brows, and I thank you for your attention. Um, it should be a little confusing because they both affect the likelihood. They both affect predictions, but we've independently assigned them initial information states. So how do we see what they imply? Uh, prior to seeing any data, what does this little machine think about the distribution of adult heights? Well, you can sample and see. So let me show you that real quick. We can take samples from the prior distribution for the mean mu. That's what happens on the first line of code here. We take, use R norm, which is random normal numbers. Um, we get 10,000 of them. That's what 1E4 is. Uh, with mean 156 and standard deviation 10, because that was the prior we chose. You could use other priors, and I encourage you to play around with this and see what you get. We can take samples from sigma using runif, which is random uniform. Um, 10,000 of them uh, between 0 and 50. Uh, then we can generate random heights uh, from the prior. So remember, this is what the machine thinks before you've seen any data, and it's really what it thinks is really dumb. Uh, but we want to see what it thinks. Uh, and what it thinks is what it expects about the distribution of 10,000 simulated human heights. We get by just plugging the samples into our norm again. But now we're simulating heights. It's the top level of the model. Right? It's like we've crawled up from the bottom and we're simulating data out of it. Uh, and then I just plot the density of the simulations, and you can see it's this odd-looking distribution. Uh, it's approximately t-distributed. Uh, those of you who know something about sampling theory, t-distributions are, are normal distributions where you're uncertain about the standard deviation, so you get these thick tails in them. This isn't exactly a t, because there's, there's uncertainty about both the mean and the standard deviation, but this has thicker tails than a normal distribution, because the machine doesn't know. Uh, and so it represents its uncertainty by saying, you know, the tails could be pretty thick. I wouldn't be... It's not impossible that you have a really, really short person or a really, really tall person, right? It's not an empirical uh, prediction. It's an epistemological thing. It's what the machine sort of expects calibrated for its uncertainty. Does this make a little bit of sense? I can tell from the furrowed brows you're paying attention, and again, I thank you uh, for that. Uh, you have to be patient with yourself with this stuff. This is what sort of what the machine sees, and by doing little simulations like this, you can decide whether the prior makes any sense given the scientific context you're in. Uh, when you have domain knowledge, you can use good priors for initial machine states. If you can't, in this class, I will teach you the horoscope priors, which are the generally super vague, mainly not going to make you play in traffic priors. Uh, that'll, that'll help you do regression modeling. Um, but you can nearly always do better when you know something about the system you work with. Um, so now we want to condition on data because we have a lot of data. Uh, Nancy Howell did a lot of work out there in the Kalahari and did a lot of interviews and uh, uploaded it all on the internet for us all to use. So um, we're going to use her data and uh, do some updating. Again, the, the aim is to get the posterior distribution. <laughs> now it has two dimensions because there's two parameters. So it's a di joint distribution in both directions. What does this mean conceptually? Uh, what this means is, so last week the posterior distribution for the globe tossing data was for every possible value of p, the proportion of water on the globe, we needed to assign a relative plausibility, conditional on the model and data. Yeah? Remember that? Now we've got two dimensions. So now for every combination of mu and sigma, we must assign a relative plausibility. And there are a lot of combinations. Right? There, so you have an infinite number of mu's and an infinite number of sigma's, then you've got an infinity squared number of combinations. Right? But that's no problem in that. 
we can do that. Basically, we've got continuous dimensions, and we're going to do grids across both to get this motivated. This will be the last grid approximation example, just to show you there's no hocus pocus, and then we'll move to approximations, in particular map quadratic approximation using map estimation. Uh, but we're going to do the grid approximation, so there's no sorcery about this, no superstition about what's going on. Uh, and you can always fall back on grid approximation if you've got time to wait for your computer to finish, uh, as you'll see. So um, in the book, I give you uh, the grid approximation code. I'm not going to step through it in class because it's really just not time, but it's in the book, and I encourage you to play with it. Uh, at least run it, even if you don't understand it. And if you want to understand it, please harass me. It won't be harassment. I would be happy to explain it. I geek out on things like this. Uh, it's fun. But there's just things about computing there that are, give you no conceptual insight, so I don't want to focus on it, okay? Um, but, but if you're curious, it's, it's all there, and, and I do a lot of explanation in the notes uh, book uh, about it. So what we see is uh, we get these samples. Um, so I do the grid approximation, then I've drawn samples from it to help you visualize it, and it's a cloud now looking top down, so it's like a hill. Uh, and one dimension on the horizontal here is the mean. Uh, and then uh, sigma, you notice that it's pretty tight, right? This isn't a big range. It's basically between uh, 154 and 156 is, is the range on the bottom. Yeah, come on. So each cell in the grid is the value, um, which is the value of the cost of the Yeah, it's a combination of sigma and mu and, and the mark of white is the same calculus as the population. Yeah, so the question was, that's right. Uh, the, the question was, so each little cell in this grid is some combination of mu and sigma, yes, and then on this graph, where there's lots of blue, that means the posterior probability is high. And where it's white, uh, no samples were drawn in the 10,000 samples that I got. So it has a very, so the peak of this mountain is sort of in the middle there, and this thing is Gaussian in both directions, so it's a nice gentle hill that you could climb without sh special shoes and gear, right? It's not El Capitan. Uh, it's, it's a nice mountain. Um, if we look at this mountain from either side and see its profile, you get what are called marginal distributions for each parameter. And that's what I'm showing on the right-hand side of this slide. And you're going to look at mainly at marginal distributions when you do uh, Bayesian statistics. Marginal means it averages over the uncertainty in all the other parameters. And it, it really is just like standing, for mu, it would be like standing down here where the word mu is on the left-hand part of this slide and looking at the hill this way. And then you'd see... Uh, that shape uh, on the top. Because you can't see sigma, so you just see the outline of the hill from the mu direction. And then if you walk around to the other side and look at it this way, you end up marginalizing over mu. I mean, you can't see mu because its dimension is blocked out, and now you see the profile of uncertainty for sigma. Does that make some sense? Uh, through exercises, when this really starts to make sense, you'll get it. It's like motor memory, right? Uh, I always make this joke in this class, so I'll do it again. Uh, I watched, I've watched a lot of Jackie Chan movies. I think I've seen them all, uh, although it's hard to be sure. <laughs> and yet I cannot do Kung Fu, right? Uh, you can watch Jackie Chan all day long and get no better at Kung Fu, in fact. Uh, and uh, stats is a lot like that in the sense that you can watch it all day long and get no better at it. Kind of got to go in there and get your motor memory uh, uh, going. And it's, it's more like brain memory, but uh, there's something about embodying the knowledge and getting comfortable with it as you go. You have to actually do it. And lots of intellectual tasks, I think, are like that. There's an athleticism uh, metaphor, which is, which is um, quite accurate. Okay, so we're going to appeal to quadratic approximation instead of doing grid approximation. Grid approximation here works great. There's nothing wrong with it. Uh, it can give you an arbitrarily good approximation of the posterior distribution. Uh, but at, as you'll see, if you look at the code in the book, um, there are a lot of combinations of mu and sigma. And the more finer you make the grid, the more and more combinations you have to look at. Now imagine adding a third parameter. So now, so you have two parameters and you want to look at 10 values of each, uh, then it's 10 squared. Uh, if you add a third parameter, 10 values of each, it's 10 cubed. Uh, pretty soon the number of combinations of parameter values you have to make a calculation for. Uh, is really big, and you need to publish your dissertation before your computer finishes, right? So uh, we have to do something else, and we will in this class use models that have thousands of parameters because that's no problem uh, for, for Markov chain Monte Carlo and other things that we're going to use. Uh, so uh, we need something other than, than brute force grid approximation, even though at its root, that's the intellectually honest way to do things, right? Um, so uh, first half of the course, as I said, we're going to use... Um, the quadratic approximation, uh, which is, say, we're going to describe the posterior distribution as a combination of peaks 
of each marginal distribution called E sub map, the maximum a posteriori, where it's the peak of this multi-dimensional hill. And right now it's only at two dimensions, so it actually has a peak. In three dimensions, it's like a hyperpeak. But uh, it's out there. And then in 2,000 dimensions, don't ask what it is. But it's there, right? Out there in Hilbert space is what we call it. Uh, and, uh, uh, and the standard deviation, which gives us the widths uh, of each. And since the whole thing, it's assumed to be Gaussian in every dimension, you can describe the multivariate Gaussian probability distribution with just a vector of means and a vector of standard deviations and, and covariances, which we'll also need uh, to get. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get to those as, as we go through the lecture. Um, so uh, mechanistically, this is just hill climbing. And you could just write it that way. You could write a little robot, if you were fancy scripters, and I know some of you are, you could write a little robot in your computer that just uh, starts at some combination of mu and sigma, it computes the posterior at that point, and then it computes the posterior at both of the little points next to it. And then it climbs uphill, right, because it's trying to find the top. And it just does that over and over again. It's the nearsighted mountaineer. It's like evolution, right, <laughs> and Darwinian evolution. It just climbs uphill. doesn't know where it's going. It's going to extinction. But it's getting fitter the whole time, right? <laughs> and it climbs all the way up to the top. And then it gets to the top, and it's like, okay, it's flat here. Uh, I can't improve the posterior probability by going in any direction. Uh, so I'm at the top. Let me measure the curvature under my feet. Uh, and that gives it the standard deviation, uh, and then it's done. Um, and it's, well, it's also got to calculate the covariance between the two, uh, uh, which is something we'll get to in a moment. But then you can describe the whole thing that way. So your R is really good at this. It has an engine called Optum, which has a bunch of different uh, algorithms for doing hill climbing, doing optimization. And uh, all the rethinking package does is appeal to Optum to do this, but it packages this up to make it a little easier on you. So uh, what you do to use um, this function map, which is in the rethinking package, uh, is you make a uh, list, which is your model statements. I show you an example here. I call it FLIST for formula list. Um, and this is a, a kind of variable in R called a list. Uh, a list does not process. So you can put all kinds of nonsense inside of it, and R will never detect it. That's what lets this work, by the way. So you do have to police yourself. Although map will tell you when you screw up. Uh, so we're just restating the model. Um, and I'll show you the correspondence on the next slide. And then you pass this formula list to the function map. And map finds maps and returns the quadratic approximate posterior distribution uh, for this thing. So I'm going to show you how to work with this. And we're going to use map for the first half of the course before we, we switch to MCMC. Um, and even when we switch to MCMC, we're going to use the same kind of input formulas. The models will be expressed the same way. But the engine underneath will look different. Okay? Uh, so you'll get used to this, and then you won't have to learn... Um, uh, a new kind of input language as we go. And you also have to tell it what data to use, right? You see there, data equals D2. Um, so let me show you the correspondence. Uh, in our code, height is a variable in the data table in HAL1, the data you get out of the package. Um, it's just a list of heights. And D norm is the density function for a normal distribution in R. Uh, the tilde means tilde, right? It means distributed as. Um, and then you make these labels mu and sigma, and you can put anything there you want. Uh, the joke I, I think I use in the book or in some former version of the book is pickle and tartus, or whatever you like, depending upon your popular culture references you want to make. And uh, doesn't, R doesn't care, uh, but you should care because you have to read this thing or your colleagues do later. Mm -hmm. And uh, mu and sigma are perfectly, would, perfectly good because they're cues that you're, using, you're doing a linear regression. Then you define your priors the same way. Priors look like likelihoods in this statement because they're just assumptions about probability distributions. They map parameters onto distributions or other parameters. Uh, and same thing in there. So you can see the correspondence. Um, after you run it, uh, uh, I should go back a couple slides. You'll see um, the output for map is stored in some symbol here, M4.1. This is the convention I'll use in the book. We're in Chapter 4. This is the first model. Right? M means model. That's the convention I'm going to be using as we go through the book. Um, in a previous version of the note, they were all called little m. <laughs> this time, I was the only person who could make sense of it, right? And then people aggressed against me, and I'm, I'm getting better. I'm trying. <laughs> uh, so uh, there's this summary function in the rethinking package called Tracy, uh, which is French for abstract, right? <laughs> or sort of like that. So you have summary, uh, basically. It means precise. It's a precise description of what's going on. The Tracy. And uh, it, was a, it was a word that was not already used by any other package, and so I decided to use it. And besides, Laplace was French, and he was sort of the father of Bayesian inference, so this is homage to Laplace. Um, and you just give it your fit model, and it gives you the summary of the, of the quadratic approximation. This is the typical kind of statistical summary you get. What I want to convince you of in this course, however, is that these summary tables are terrible, terrible, terrible. 
with this model, uh, the model is so, I mean, not mine in particular. Mine might be especially bad, but I think it's really hard to understand models from tables of estimates, of summaries of estimates. Really hard. For a model like this, you can get away with it because mo this model is incredibly simple. It's just about the <coughs> simplest, uh, serious statistical model we're going to do in the course. Um, next week, uh, summary tables will be nearly useless. And I'm going to try and give you some examples about that. And you, I see this in print all the time, papers where all you've got is a table of coefficients. And that is insufficient to reconstruct predictions from the model. That's what I'm going to try to convince you of. It is hard to understand a model from tables of coefficients. Very hard. Um, hard to understand interaction effects and lots of other important things that go on. So I'm going to try to persuade you. You can look at the Precy stuff. There's no harm in doing it, but that's never sufficient. And I'm going to uh, teach you to, to push predictions out of the model to understand what the implications are of these estimates. Okay. Um, so in this case, we get a posterior. Just, so the mu line, the mean, uh, say the map, the peak of the marginal posterior distribution for mu, which is shown uh, on the bottom left on this slide is at 154.6. You know, don't, don't fetishize precision, right? Uh, it's somewhere around there. And with a standard deviation of 0.41, and I show you that distribution on the bottom. The blue um, is the grid approximate, the samples from the grid approximation. And the dashed part is the quadratic approximation, just constructed by plotting a normal distribution with mean 154.6 and standard deviation 0.4, right? So you can see it did a pretty good job, right? The quadratic approximation works really well in this model. Um, uh, and then for sigma, the same thing as a mean at 7.7 .7 and a standard deviation of around 0.3. Uh, in this case, you can see there's some mismatch between the grid approximation calculation, which is better because it didn't make assumptions about the normality of the posterior distribution, and the quadratic approximation doesn't quite hit it. The, the posterior distribution for sigma is skewed. It has a longer tail to the right. This will nearly always be true. Um, so... Uh, uh, later on in the course, that'll be fine. Uh, so to show you, uh, with a lot of data, the skew will be very small. To emphasize this to you, here's an example where I just take 20 heights, only 20 heights, and I just update the priors using only those 20. So now there's way less certainty. Uh, now there's a lot more skew in sigma, um, as you can see there on the right. I'm showing you the whole posterior on the top. You can see it's like a snowball that was thrown from down here, and it's kind of exploded up. So there's more uncertainty towards large values. Uh, and that's because, uh, well, in a casual way, um, uh, sigma can't be less than zero, right? Standard deviations must be positive. So there's nearly always more uncertainty about how big the standard deviation is than how small it is. And that's how they get this skew in this. When we get to Markov chain Monte Carlo, we won't have to use this compromise. And there's a little box in chapter four where I show you how to patch this up with something called a log link, if you're curious, uh, if you start getting into trouble. But for the examples we use in this course, we will pay scant attention to sigma, as most people do. Uh, and so you won't feel any violence being done. But you should just keep in mind this is an approximation. Um, uh, and if you have trouble with that, let me know, and I'll help you fix it up. Um, so let me say, uh, uh, MAP is a, is a scaffold. It's, it's just about the least convenient way to fit a linear regression that I could think of. Uh, actually, no, I could think of less convenient ways, actually, now that I actually say that out loud. Um, but uh, it's not really convenient. But the reason I use it in this course is not because I'm mean, uh, but rather because when you're learning this stuff, you want to do it in a, in a way that forces you to state every assumption of the model as you go through. Um, then there is a little tool in, in R called LM for linear models. It'll fit linear regressions with one line with way less input than this and give you almost exactly the same quadratic approximation for the posterior. Uh, and it's fine to use LM, and in fact, at the end of chapter four, or actually, I think it's the end of chapter five, actually, I, I re-explain how to fit linear regressions in R using LM and explain the correspondence between the two, uh, and that's fine. But if you all you do is start with LM, you probably never really learn what's going on, uh, so that's why I do it this way. The other uh, reason uh, to uh, focus on a tool like MAP is later on, especially when we get to chapter six, but you'll start to see this next week with chapter five, um, I keep saying flat priors are never the best priors, uh, and there's a very important reason for that. It's because uh, uh, they get flat priors get too excited. So if your machine starts with I have no clue, it could be any parameter value, then it'll believe any parameter value, <laughs> including really really silly ones. Uh, and so I'm going to show you uh, in chapter six that you can nearly always do better by having conservative priors called regularizing priors. And this is not a uniquely Bayesian perspective. It's also uh, the, the dominant tradition in non-Bayesian statistics. It's called regularization. Uh, and it's dominant because you make better predictions when you regularize. 
We will postpone on what that means. Uh, but LM, you cannot regularize. It has no way to conventionally regularize. Uh, with this, you can. Yeah, question. Oh, well, about priors, are there some situations in which using a prior versus not using one makes a really big difference to the outcome of the model? Uh, so the question was, are there situations in which using a prior versus not makes a really big difference? Oh, yes, lots. I mean, uh, priors could be anything. So you could, you could choose a really goofy prior and get a really weird answer, and that would obviously make a difference. With a Bayesian model, you have to use a prior. Your choices are just, is it flat or not? Uh, and absolutely, it can make a difference. Uh, and so as we go through examples, I, I hope to convince you that flat priors aren't the best because you always know something uh, about what's going on, about reasonable values of the parameter uh, before you get in. Especially with Markov Chain Monte Carlo, just to get the thing to run, you've got to use that information a little bit. You've got to tell it that 2 million is not a plausible value, or it will take samples out at 2 million occasionally and cause you grief. Um, so you need to do things like that. Um, uh, I know I'm not directly answering your question because, again, it's like the horoscope problem. I'm, I'm in the vague general case, and I've just got to tell you that, like, you know, your moon is in Mercury or, I don't know, that makes no sense in astrology. Sorry. <laughs> your house is in something. I don't know. <laughs> Mars is in your house? No. That sounds, sounds like a rap album. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, you know what I mean. <laughs> and uh, uh, so... I beg your indulgence. We'll have examples of priors and some of the differences, and I'll even have examples. There's no reason for you to use only one prior. Uh, this, if you're not sure what prior to use, do sensitivity analysis. It's an assumption, just like the likelihood, just like the linear models we're going to get to just before I let you go. And um, those are all just assumptions. So if you don't feel strongly you can justify any particular assumption, you should vary it and see if it makes a big difference in the conclusions. Uh, and that's, You do that with priors. You do that with likelihoods. You do that with linear models. Do it with every part of the... Everything but the data. Don't vary the data and see if it makes a difference. Well, actually, that's not, that could be a good, good idea, too, right? If you get the same answer regardless of the data, that's a pretty strong argument. But, <laughs> um, then probably the data is not doing anything in the model, though. So uh, Anyway, so I just wanted to say, MAP is a tool, and you will graduate away from it, uh, almost certainly, uh, at some point. But I, I've made it as a teaching tool. It was coded up entirely in the context of this course um, and uh, for students. And I think, you know, past years... Uh, uh, either students develop Stockholm Syndrome during this course, or they find the tools useful. Um, so, how do we get a predictor in here? Uh, regression usually implies that there's something associated with something else, and we don't have that yet. We just have a Gaussian model of the distribution of adult heights in the Kalahari San from the 1960s. That's all we have. So, uh, what about the relationship between weight and height? Not a thrilling scientific question, but it'll help you see how to get a, a simple uh, model that, that looks at... Uh, measures the association between these two variables and gives you plausibilities for that association. It gives you a distribution of relative plausibilities for all the strengths of association that you allow. Uh, uh, so we'll construct that. So here's just the bivariate scatter plot for weight and height. We're going to make a model uh, of these two things. So there's going to be some new stuff here, so uh, bear with me and I'll go through it step by step. Um, this is uh, the classic linear model. At the top level, we still just have a Gaussian likelihood. The only thing that's different now is I've taken that little subscript i and I've put it on mu. You see that? Uh, that means the, the mean depends upon the individual now. It's going to be a function of some feature of the individual. Whereas before, every individual in a sense had the same mean. That is, every individual was treated from an epistemological perspective the same way. There was no individual features of them that we could use to improve prediction. Now we're going to do that. And so that we, we put the little i on mu so we can make mu a function of something about individual i. You with me? Does that make sense? Uh, the next line defines that assumption. We, we make mu sub i uh, a deterministic function of another variable that we have. Uh, we create two more parameters, alpha and beta. Uh, and the data in this case is x sub i, which will be the weight of individual i. What are alpha and beta? Well, they're things that describe the shape of this function, and that's all they are. They're inventions that you put into the machine uh, to ask questions. And the questions they particularly ask are... Um, uh, alpha answers the question, when weight is zero, what should I guess about height? Right? You can see how the function implies that. If you set x to zero, then mu sub i equals alpha. And so alpha answers the question, uh, when weight is zero, what is height? Now that's a bit weird because weight is never zero. When weight is zero, you're, you're not a cell. You're like a fertilizer. You're a zygote. Right? So the, the linear, and that's an important thing to say about this model, is linear models are always goofy if you push them far enough. So weight is not going to go to zero in the data, so you don't have to worry about it, but uh, in principle it could. Um, 
and b is the rate of change for every unit change in weight in x it's the change in mu right it's the change in the mean for every unit change in x and with those two questions we've defined a line that relates x to the mean of height not to individual heights because individual heights are still have this uncertainty distribution it's a function of both the mean and the standard deviation uh, but our deterministic mean here, we have a model of the mean, and linear regressions are models of the mean. They don't model the standard deviation, they just estimate it. It's whatever's left over. That's why it's often called error. It's not a term I like, right? Because each of you is a precious snowflake, and your height is different from others, but it doesn't make it an error. Right? <laughs> Sorry, I'm an anthropologist, right? There are no errors. <laughs> um, so uh, then we define priors. Now we have three parameters. We define a prior for each. Um, there's a really effectively flat prior on alpha. Uh, a standard deviation of 100 is effectively flat. That's a super wide Gaussian distribution, right? Incredibly wide. Um, uh, a practically uninformative prior on beta centered on zero. Zero would mean there's no relationship between weight and height, right? Because it would cancel out in the linear model, uh, the variable x. And a standard deviation of 10 makes it pretty wide. It gives it a variance of 100. So it's still pretty wide. Um, and, then, and then the uniform distribution we used before. And I encourage you to, to explore these priors. You want to alter them and rerun the model and see what impact they have. In this case, there's so much data, as you'll see, that uh, you can use uh, really tight priors and they get overwhelmed. There's so much data here. Um, but you have to experiment with that yourself to understand it. So let's think about what's going on and go through the anatomy of the linear model again, which is the, where the action is. Um, <clears throat> Mu sub i is the mean uh, on rho i, and it's defined by this function down at the bottom, alpha plus beta xi. And alpha and beta are distributions, or they're parameters. And they don't have some true value. Uh, now, these are devices, alpha and beta, so they don't exist independently in the world. So how can they have true values? They're, they're true conditional in using this model to measure height. Right? There are particular values of alpha and beta which would give you the best predictions, right? or describe the sample in the best way, depending upon your purpose. That's, what, that's how they're defined as being true or not. Uh, but they, they don't exist objectively in the world. They're parameters, right? Even a parameter like speed of light it doesn't actually exist in the world, right? Light has speed, but it doesn't mean speed is a property of the world. Uh, now you're like, dude. <laughs> uh, yes, and dude, but that's my philosophy of, of, of natural history. Um, so uh, uh, x of i is the weight on rho i. You understand how that works. Um, Alpha answers the question, what is the mean when x equals 0? We often call this the intercept, because in the equation for a line that you learned in secondary school, or middle school, actually. I forget when people learn lines. Middle school, yeah. And uh, uh, that's how you learn this, uh, what the intercept meant. When, the, when x is 0, it's the value of y. Um, and beta is the change in the mean per unit change in x. We usually call this a slope, because it'll be helped tilted the line. I'm going to graph this in a moment. So chances are, this is like deja vu for you guys. You've learned linear models before, and this is some weird way of looking at the same stuff that was easy, and now it seems hard. <laughs> right? And if that's the case, then you're welcome. <laughs> uh, I've achieved my objective uh, in this. Because I think, actually, these models can be pretty hard. They're simple statistical models, but even the simplest statistical models can be very confusing. Uh, and that's a message I want to get across as we go. All right, I've only got a couple of minutes, so let me try to get through this um, show you how to fit this model in using math, and then when you come back on Thursday, uh, we'll plot predictions from it, so you can really understand the model and learn how to dissect them. So here's a restatement of the model, and by each of the math stats uh, definitions of a, an assumption in the model, I put the corresponding code that you put in a formula list uh, inside the R code. Um, I think the correspondence is fairly simple. The only thing to really note is that the equal sign that defines the linear model in the math on the left you don't use an equal sign in R because equals is this very special thing in computer code that actually assigns things to memory. And there's no getting away from that. So instead, we use the R convention of the little assignment operator, the arrow, the little left arrow, and that'll work great. Uh, what's great about this, too, is that's a convention in lots of software packages. Um, so Bayesian uh, model fitting uh, software like Bugs and Stan use exactly the same convention. Uh, from R, that's where they got it. So you, you learn this convention of using this silly little left pointing arrow, and it'll it'll last you your whole life, maybe. Um, and then define the priors, same way. 
You put this into the R code for math the same way. I just want to show you here, you can you don't have to make the formula list its own little thing. You can just embed it in your call to map like this. And in fact, most of the time you probably will, because if you're like me, you're lazy, and this is how you do it. Uh, but if you made it a separate thing, you can reuse it um, and, and fit it to different data. Uh, but it works the same way. Notice that there are commas at the end of each line, because it's a list, and lists in R have commas that separate the entries. Pass it to data, uh, you're ready to go. Um, something to say at this point that I meant to say, and this will this will be my last 30 seconds of today's lecture. Um, Map is a hill climber. Uh, it optimizes. It has this multi-dimensional topography that's got to climb, which is the posterior distribution. It's got to find the peak and then measure the curvature at the peak. And so the question is, where does it start climbing? Um, it starts climbing at random locations. It picks from the priors. Uh, is the way it's set up. So you define a prior for a parameter. Uh, it just samples some random value from each of these priors, and that's where the mountaineer, the near side mountaineer, starts climbing. Often you can do better than that. So if you're having trouble getting it to climb well, um, you can pass an optional list of starting values. And there's an example in the book about how to do that. And sometimes that's true. If you have a really, really flat prior, the random value you pull could be way out in no man's land where there's basically no incline. And then it can't climb up because it looks flat in both directions, and it just panics. And then R gives you some ugly warning message that you can't interpret and you send me an email about VM min finite difference error or something like that. And I'll be like, aha, yes, I'm familiar with this cozy, cozy, cozy error. I advise a start value or a tighter prior. And then it'll work great. So when, when that inevitably happens to you, let me know. Uh, and we'll fix it up. And this is just part of doing computational statistics is that how you fit the model is part of the model uh, because fitting the model in different ways entails different kinds of mistakes and different approximations. Uh, and this isn't the traditional way we think about it. We think about the model as being this thing that lives in the in, in the platonic world of perfection, of mathematical perfection. It's like the definition at the top of this slide. But when you use it to do stuff, you had to fit it some way. And the way you fit it entails different compromises and different kinds of hazards. And so how you fit the model can have an effect. And we work hard to remove any of those kinds of errors from it, but you need to keep it in mind. All right. With that hopefully uplifting message, uh, I'll let you guys go, and I'll see you on Thursday. Thank you.